offered up his life. Oh, what a sacrifice. Good morning, friends. Glad to see you all here at Willow Grove Baptist Church on this beautiful Sunday. And it's just right, not too hot out, just right. And we have plenty of prayer conditioning inside here. And uh, we, well, we didn't have volume for our opening uh, video, but luckily you'll still get to hear George and I. That's the main thing. <laughs> and Lauren. <laughs> yes, you'll get to hear Lauren, and we'll get to hear your prayers. <laughs> So we'll get started in just a minute. We'll have the lyrics up on screen for everybody to sing along. And George will have a great message, which you will be able to hear. So please stand and let's get started. Oh, 
Breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me. Breathe on me, breath of God, breathe on me. And I come alive, I'm alive when you breathe on me. And I come alive, I'm alive when you breathe on me. Awake, awake, awake my soul. God resurrect these bones from death to life. For you alone, awake my soul. Speak to me, word of God, speak to me, speak to me, word of God, speak to me. And I come alive, I'm alive when you speak to me. And I come alive, I'm alive when you speak to me. Awake, awake, awake my soul. God resurrect these bones from death to life for you. submission 
all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Guys, you can be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We're excited to have you here with us today. And thank God that it is not 100 degrees anymore because uh, it was a very hot week. Oh. Um, if you're a new visitor, we are excited to have you here with us. Uh, if you could take a minute and check in with us, we have QR codes on the back of the pews if you're a techie person. If you're not feeling so techie today, that's okay. We have uh, visitor cards in the pew as well that you can fill out and drop in the box. If you're online with us, you can connect with us at willowgrovebaptist.org backslash connect. Right now, we are running a school supply drive for Thomas Fitzwater Elementary. As you know, we sit right on the corner of like four different districts. But Thomas Fitz is one of our closest elementary schools, and we have several families that are part of that school. And we've spoken to the, congr to the counselor there, and they could really use some different school supplies to help out some families that aren't able to purchase them. So Brick's been running a school supplies drive. We also have a box up front here uh, in the lobby if anybody's interested in dropping any off. Uh, volunteer opportunities. I have a couple different needs that we still have. We're in need of two children's church workers and three nursery workers coming up for the fall. So if you're interested, uh, take a minute, touch base with me later today so I can get you onto the schedule and we can get you guys set up. If you're interested in being a greeter, which is as simple as saying hi to everybody and checking them off or giving out bulletins, uh, we could use some of those. Or if you're musically inclined or like to think that you're musically inclined, uh, like John, uh, take a minute and touch base with him uh, or Pastor George or I, and we'd love to have some special music that we could do as well. Um, I believe, oh, a couple things to mark your calendars for as well. Uh, first Sunday of September is Move Up Sunday, so that means if you have kiddos and they are going up to the next level, that is where they're going to be moving up to their new classroom. So if you have second graders going into third grade, they're going to be moving up from junior kids' church to kids' church. If you have new sixth graders, they are coming in here with us, uh, so be prepared for some extra fun with some more youth in the service. And if you have littles that are three that moving up to four, they are be going from nursery into junior kids' church. Church. Uh, we also have some signs out in the lobby. We have, if you want to mark your date for a big worship fest that they have going on at Carson Simpson Christian Camp on October 15th, and we're going to be doing a table there. So if you're interested in helping out with that, it's a free all day Christian concert. And the 22nd, right after that, is our big trunk or treat. So lots of fun things coming up. Uh, not a ton of things going on in August because we're still in, I feel like, vacation season. But starting in September, we have a lot of things going on again. All right. All right, so um, move the slider that says pastor on the left side a little bit higher in the soundboard. So hopefully we don't get the same kind of screeching we did last week. But it's down below, it's not on the laptop. Lauren, got it. All right, so, for, and uh, we will need a volunteer. Jay, I'm calling you out. Uh, do you want to grab the microphone for the prayer requests in a minute? So at this point in our service, we are... Uh, thanking all those who have partnered with us, thanking those who, there we go, thanking those who have made this possible, um, provided electricity for the fans, for the central air, for the lighting, uh, for sound equipment that sometimes works, um, for the paintbrushes to help in our kids' ministry painting. And so we want to thank you for your giving. Uh, one of the things that I thought would be different this week is normally churches are like, please give, and here's 4,700 reasons to give. 
we help a lot of people out each week, whether through our food pantry led by Rick and his team or clothing closet or people that call us for certain needs. And all that's done and that's capable because we have this building. But the building is falling apart because it's old. And as we get older, we need to do maintenance. And so there's a lot of areas that we're looking to improve. Even our parking lot, we are in the process of updating and giving that a nice fresh look. Uh, so in order to do all this on a dime, we are asking not, f if you can give financially, terrific. Uh, that's with God and you and um, convictions. But give of your time, your talents, and your treasures. Now what that means is, Maybe some of us aren't in a place where we can give financially. Maybe tithing's difficult. Maybe the finances are tight. But can we give of our time? Can we donate 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour a week? Uh, d uh, volunteer with a food pantry. Do volunteer with the clothing, sorting clothes. Or volunteer, maybe you're an artist and you can paint. Or maybe you can help send out letters. So giving of your time. Talents. Maybe you spent years at a school and you're good w you have beautiful handwriting well we have lots of people that we would love to connect with and type with although i look like a four-year-old trying to write with crayons so it's nice to have pretty handwriting uh, when we go to write letters out to those who can't make it to church so maybe you are talented in different ways maybe you don't electrocute yourself every time you touch an outlet we need you too so time talent and treasures treasure speaks for itself and maybe that's just some fall cleaning Maybe it's like, yeah, I really can't fit in those pants after uh, the quarantine or COVID, so it's time to let go of those. And I, they're my favorite pants. I love those pants. They have more holes in them than they should, but it's time to let go of them. Uh, that's our treasures, so it's parting with our treasures and giving to God's kingdom. And so uh, we appreciate all those who help to support us so that we can continue to bless our community, bless our neighbors, and bless those who are able to uh, reach out to the church. Uh, even this week, our deacons team has received two benevolence requests, and we're working with those families to help them in this time of need. And so we also are in the month of August, and so we'll skip the video, and we'll go right to this one. Perfect. Um, th during this month, if you are sitting in a pew and not online, uh, we will be sure to get some information out online shortly this week. Uh, we partnered with, through American Baptist Church, one great hour of giving now, we have a beautiful video that will bring you to tears and talks about the beauty of having water and how it flourishes uh, neighbors and creates community and creates marketplace, and we have no sound on our board today. So, <laughs> imagine if you will. <laughs> um, but one great hour of giving is really a great opportunity for us to help bless those around the world. 100% it, it, of the giving goes right to one hour of giving. There's envelopes in your pews. There is a, I believe there's an online drop box uh, if you go to our online giving. And so 100% of that goes to help communities, goes to help families, goes to help homes, goes to help kids who don't have wells, who don't have clean water, who have a greater chance of dying from diarrhea than they do living to 30 years old. And so it's a great organization, great cause. Feel free to check it out. Uh, I don't know their website offhand, but if you Google one, eight, one Great Hour of Giving ABC, um, that will help get you more information. We will have a video next week. Lord willing, our technology works. <laughs> so <laughs> at, that, at this time, um, we are going to be lifting up some prayer requests as well as thanking God for what praises. What happened this week that we are thankful for God for? And so to help connect our in-person audience with our online audience, uh, Jay's going to bring around a microphone for anybody that wants to share. And uh, that way, those online can also hear what great things are happening or what great things we're reaching out for God to happen in these things. So I'm going to hand it over to Jay, and everyone online can stare at me awkwardly. <laughs> I just want to thank God for a great week with friends and family. We went to the beach, and, you know, it was through God and through our friends that we were able to go. Um, also, this week on Wednesday, we pick our runs for the bus. And if anybody knows anything about me, I hate change, and I have absolutely no control. And over the years, I've had some great kids, and I miss them every time. So who knows where I'll be? <laughs> But each time, I hate it, and it turns out being really great, too. 
and I understand why I was put in that spot. So, you know, just prayers that it's good. <laughs> It'll be exciting to see where God places you for the school year. Morgan? Hi, um, my name is Morgan. Um, so just some praises. Uh, we, my, my family and I, we were um, really not well a couple of weeks ago, so now we're feeling a little bit better. Now my husband and I, not so much, and the baby, so just prayers for recovery, but we are getting out of there and feeling a little better. And uh, the, the baby started walking, so that's awesome. Woo! <laughs> so it's just, just prayers for when both children go in the opposite direction that we can handle it. So <laughs> just family prayers for feeling better and that getting through the week. Yeah. It's awesome until they find the steps or the uh, <laughs> <laughs> outlets. <laughs> Camille? I have a praise. Um, my Uncle George, who we pray about all the time, he will be 86 today been through some kind of journey with his health and everything so that's a big praise and another praise yesterday I don't know and, and I don't look at Facebook that often but you know I need it for different communications and for some reason it just went wacky yesterday and went to a new page that was mine but it wasn't you know wasn't mine it was empty so make a long story short Something said, I have a Verizon phone. Something said, well, stop in the Verizon and see if they can help you. I said, I told the guy, his name was Patrick. I said, I don't know if he can help me, but I told him what the problem was. And to make a long story short, he got it up and running and got rid of that uh, bogus page. I don't know what was happening. And, uh, you know, praise the Lord for Patrick. And the Lord heard me. I, I just, uh, I was so thankful. So um, that that's uh, my praises. And my prayer is just that, the violence will stop in, in our beautiful city of Philadelphia and all, all around. Just the gun violence. Just I pray pray that some somehow things will will not you know continue like this. And that, and that that's my prayer. Absolutely. Uh, we have Chris and Rick both. Yeah. Uh, yeah, our, our pantry's been uh, serving a lot of people, and we, for the first time, we're going to exceed 100 families in a week. And it's been hard to keep up with food, and so I contacted Willow Grove Giant this week to see if we could possibly have another food drive down there. And, uh, and we were hoping for mid-September, and she came back and called me later the following day and said, we saw you're collecting for school supplies, too, so... Uh, it got bumped up. We're going to be doing a food drive on August the 27th, and it's going to be not only a food drive, but a school supply drive, too. So I was very thankful for that. That's great. I just want to thank God for this beautiful day and everyone being here today. Um, had a weird thing happen last night. I didn't even know I had bats in the neighborhood, but in my bedroom, a bat flew right in through in my bedroom. Oh! <laughs> but thank God, I wasn't afraid. It was it wasn't an ugly bat. It was like it was a beautifully shaped bat, <laughs> <laughs> and I just watched it fly around. And then later on, I caught it on a trap, and everything was fine. So, <laughs> and don't <laughs> don't worry, I'm not going to put on a costume and uh, mm -hmm. fight crime. But uh, <laughs> but just uh, keep my family in prayer. Um, the Hanton family, we have a family crisis going on, so keep the Han Hanton family in prayer. No more uninvited visitors. <laughs> um, for my best friend, Liz, she's having um, issues with her pregnancy. She's... Um, 18 weeks along and her numbers aren't going where they need to be so um, prayers for her to numbers and everything to go where they should be thanks Joanna so I have a prayer and a praise um, first um, prayers for my um, one of my family friends who recently had a uh, grandfather pass um, Mesa Lion, um, but also praises for further away. Just stand over. 
You're good. Okay. Better? Yeah. Okay. And also praises for all of the um, incoming children for Children's Church because I remember when we had like four total kids. So I appreciate having like an entire class full. It's great. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, it's amazing with the kids' church. We had to uh, do a junior kids' church in order to fit every kid in the room, so it's amazing. Right. All right. All right, let's take these to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the many blessings, the, the community that helps to support us, feeding over 100 families. We thank you for the blessings of vacations and breaks and opportunities to breathe and slow down. Lord, we thank you for the jobs and the new jobs and the jobs that are transitioning. Lord, we thank you for opportunities that we can trust you in this faithfulness as change is always hard and sometimes change is painful, but we trust you nonetheless. Lord, we pray for you. Uh, be with us during these times of healing, even when COVID is still very much a uh, concern and a problem. We pray for the families out there that are struggling with it. We pray for the families that are struggling with other sicknesses that don't get quite the same type of attention. We pray for the other sicknesses, the other people at the hospital, the accidents that happen daily. Lord, we pray for the doctors and the nurses that continue to work long shifts and is trying to stay safe to s keep the sickness at workplace and not bring it home. Lord, we pray for <coughs> uh, Uncle George, and we thank, thank you for his uh, 86th birthday today. Lord, we thank you for each of our birthdays that we get to celebrate and we get to uh, enjoy and we get to be with. Lord, we thank you that these are wonderful days of celebration that reminds us of the wonderful blessings that you've given us throughout the year. Lord, we pray for our city, our community. We pray for the city of Philadelphia. We pray for the, the uh, meaningless violence that occurs there. Lord, we pray for our police there that are caught in between the protecting those in need and fighting against those who do havoc. Lord, we pray for the safety of those um, individuals. Lord, we lift up August 22nd to you the, the, as the community is able to help support our uh, desire to bless a uh, local school and to bless the families that come here. Lord, we pray for the uh, collection drive that Giant will be doing and the many people involved in that. And we thank Giant Grocery Store and the willingness to partner with us. Lord, we pray for uh, the Hanton family. We pray for the, the crisis that they're facing. We pray that you bring peace and comfort into a very difficult time. Lord, we pray for those that are uh, having babies, both in the church and out of the church. We pray for Liz, whose pregnancy is not where it should be, but you'll get it to where it needs to be. Lord, we pray for the other babies that are coming, the nursery that we're preparing and, and fixing up for the families that are bringing little ones to for us to share the gospel with, to share love with, to care for, to uplift, to encourage in difficult times, to help families, to help parents with parenting questions, to help parents with difficult times, and even our own parenting class we're going to be launching this fall. Lord, we ask that you be in the details, that you be in the, that you call the people that need it to come. And Lord, we pray for uh, both Jennifer Moon and Tom Gilbride in their hearts and their continued strength with each day, that they continue to grow stronger uh, and that the doctors continue to be with them during these times. Lord, we pray for those online watching. We pray that they continue uh, encounter God in a mighty way. Uh, just as we can encounter God and hopefully each Sunday as we hear him speak to us and we hear this uh, truth speak to us. Lord, we continue to lift up mar marriages and families, both inside the church and outside the church. Lord, we pray that you bring faithfulness, servitude, and love, agape, unconditional love, to those marriages and families as the Holy Spirit dwells within them, bringing peace and comfort. Lord, we pray for our nation and the leadership. We pray that during the, as November comes, that you be with this country as your will be done. And Lord, we just ask that you be with us during this service. Uh, give us the words that we need to move forward. Give us the understanding that we need to grow stronger. And give us the hope that we need to grow together in unity. Amen.
All right, friends, and today George will have a message on drawing into intimacy with the Lord. Um, and with that, this is a song about seeing, listening to, and loving the Lord. And this is a brand new one. You guys will be the first to hear it. thinking about the, this uh, today's message is the cornerstone of the series uh, matters of the heart so I'm excited that we're here and hopefully um, you get a takeaway that helps you grow in your your understanding of Jesus um, today we're going to be talking about drawing into intimacy and at, at first it's like well I'm not married so this doesn't really apply but we're not going to be talking about romantic intimacy today. We're going to be talking about what it means to be close, but not just close. Like, you can be close to your, your friends. Like, they know some things about you, and they, they know. But intimacy is different than closeness. Intimacy is this idea that it's, it's, it's hard to describe unless you feel it. There's, there's, and I'm not, like, it's, it's not passionate intimacy, it's not romantic intimacy, but there's a sense of being vulnerable, being open, being transparent, 
and I spent about four years with youth, and that's the biggest problem. As a teenager, you're learning what closeness is, but you're not quite at intimacy is, and then when you look online or you talk to your friends, you get the words mixed up. You get lust and um, attractiveness mixed up with intimacy, but intimacy only comes after sacrifice. You can't build a healthy, long-lasting marriage or healthy, long-lasting friendship with intimacy without first giving sacrifice. So as we jump into this idea, I want to throw out a question. When you think of a well-performing group of people, what's the first kind of group that comes to mind? Is it a military group that's, that's functioning to complete a mission that has high danger, that has risk, that every person in the unit has to perform their job at peak, op, at peak efficiency or else somebody could die? Maybe it's, it's a football team. I love the movie Remember the Titans, and yes, I'm starting to date myself by that, but Remember the Titans is such a great movie because there's these people that are going off divided by race, but they come back united in unity. They, they look beyond the color of skin, and they look beyond the differences of each other, and they're, they're coming together in unity. Maybe first responders, uh, those who ride in the ambulance, those that are in the back have to have a certain level of unity and understanding and communication with the driver so that they can work in very difficult, stressful occasions. Uh, while working on this week's message, I, there was a study that came up as I was doing research for it, and it was done by the military on how to do uh, cohesion. How do you build cohesion in your units? And they broke it down into two main categories, and we have a slide for this one, task cohesion and social cohesion. These are the two main factors that how you, cohesion is just another word for unity. So task cohesion, if you can't see it up here because it's super tiny and... Um, one day we're going to have like 75-inch screens, and it'll be great. You can see it from the road. It'll be wonderful. Um, but task cohesion is the shared commitment among members to achieving a goal that requires the collective efforts of the group. A group with high task cohesion is composed of members who share a common goal and who are motivated to coordinate their efforts as a team to achieve their goal. So think of the workplace, or think of school when you have to do group projects, Ugh. and you're all, you're coming together, you're, you're looking past your differences, you're looking past the time commitments to say, we have to finish this task by a certain time, by a certain quality. The other type of cohesion or unity is social cohesion. Co social cohesion is the extent to which group members like each other prefer to spend their social time together, enjoy each other's company, and feel emotionally close to one another. So think of Mean Girls, where they have, okay, there's a social click of there over there, there's a social click over there, there's a social click over there, we got the jocks, we got the motorheads, we got the nerds, we got the m nerds plus chess club, so we, we have the um, oriental group over here. Like you have all these different groups, and you have all these different divisions, but together there's a social cohesion because there's things that are similar. They enjoy each other's culture. They enjoy each other's dialects. They enjoy each other's looks or contacts or the things that are similar together. It's very easy for them to say, okay, I want to be your friend because you look like me and I like me. That's one of the great difficulties, but the most important thing is, is that when we go to God, there's going to be every color of skin color that you can imagine, every language ever spoken is going to stand before God praising God. There's not going to be, okay, there's the African Americans, there's the Caucasians, there's the Asians, there's the weird people we don't talk about, like there, and we don't, we, there is none of that in the kingdom of God. That's why it's so important that as the church grows in the 21st century, that we have diversity, that we have people from different backgrounds, different languages, different countries, different everything, because neither task or social cohesion drives the gospel forward. And we see this when we look through the book of Acts, and we, we saw that these people were brought together through task cohesion. They were brought to share the gospel, but that doesn't, it breaks down when you have your own agenda. Judas was not, was not driven by task cohesion, or social cohesion, but he was part of this. He did want to be part of what Jesus was calling him to. 
But at the same point, if you have social cohesion, well, then you have a rotary club, a social club. Like, it's great. You can have a couple friends meet up and go to the gym together or play racquetball together or play basketball or soccer together. These are social clubs where people come together for the mutual enjoyment of each other based on doing something that they each enjoy together. But the gospel is different. The, God's kingdom is different from this. Uh, what's interesting is that when we look at what drives a healthy military group or a healthy group of people, you have these two factors, but there's other factors that we need to keep in mind. The other factors include a collective identity. Are we willing to put apart our differences for the sake of one unity, a moral or a positive outcome? Is this going to be worth our time and efforts to better the world? What's interesting is even Google is having problems hiring engineers because the engineers they're hiring, they want something more to life than just coding. They want to make a change. They didn't, they didn't get a 4.0 at MIT just to go and make it so that we could play games on Google's search engine. Like They wanted their lives to make a major impact. They wanted to know that their work was going to something better. Another factor is trust related to integrity. Do you trust the person that you're serving with? Do you trust the person that you're connected with? Do you know that they have your back? Can you rely on them? Dependability and social reliability. Is this a person that's going to follow through with things? Is this a person that says what they says and does what he says? So often we say, yeah, I'll be there. But then when it comes to being there, there's nowhere it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. If I got held up. Um, next time, I'll get you for sure. And when you take all these factors, this is what drives unity. This is what dr drives dependability. This is what drives intimacy. Because intimacy is founded on a sacrifice of proven follow-through. It's, it's founded on being reliable, dependable. It's founded on the idea that you're there, that you're not going to leave me even when things go wrong. So there's a very common... Uh, we'll say shape or diagram that is in the Christian world, and we've some of you might have seen it, but um, so we have this triangle, and this triangle is me and my spouse. As we approach God, we draw together, and while that's accurate, I would say it's it's limited by some. And each week, this this during a series, we're talking about the desires of our heart. If we desire to know God, are we willing to be obedient to what God's calling us to? I believe it's 11 or 13 times Jesus says to love one another. Can we love God without sacrificing or loving our neighbor? Can we love God without inviting or wanting other people to know the gospel? Can we love God without sharing our testimony? But those are scary. Yes, yeah, so is going to the cross on our behalf. Ooh, low blow. But back to the triangle. So we have this triangle that if we come together, things are going to get very difficult. But if we come together for God, then it draws us together and it draws us closer to God. But I would say the, ang the, the shape looks more like the next slide, where by coming to God, it draws us together. Now, this is, it's the same, but it's different. Jesus calls us to love one another. He calls us to be in community. He calls us to be in relationships with other people. He calls us to pull ourselves together to be with other people. Sorry, introverts. I'm, I'm there with you. It's once you're drained of all your energy because people are difficult, it's still hard. But that's even more reason why we need to draw ourselves to God. It's God who gives us the strength to work with others, to love the unlovable, to show grace, to show mercy, to be patient, to, to exercise the uh, actions of the Holy Spirit, the, the powers of the Holy Spirit. It's by seeking God that we desire to seek others. If we're not seeking others, if we're isolating ourselves or we're siloing ourselves or we're not doing the mission that God is calling us to do to love others, to preach the gospel to the ends of the nation, to support missionaries, if we're not going out and seeking them, then the relationship's just vertical. It's just a vertical line. But can you have a relationship with somebody when you ignore everything they tell you? If my wife said, hey, can you do the dishes, or I just need half an hour break from the kids, and I just turn the channel on the TV and turn it up louder, is that a relationship? 
it, it's going to get a thro- shoe thrown at me is what it is. But that's how we treat God sometimes. God, I love you so much. I, I love you, and I give my life for you. I just, my neighbors are not fun, so I'm not going to do anything that you ask me to do. And, but then we read the Bible, and we see these crazy stories about seas being parted and the dead coming back to life, and, and these amazing miracles happen. We're like, why isn't God moving mightily in my life? Why aren't we moving at all for him? And this isn't about guilting us. This isn't about doing more. This is about trusting that God does what he promises. That, the, that when we are beaten down and that we have no energy left, that we're worn out, that going to God gives us the strength to go to others. And that when we go to others, it's not just, so. oh, we've, we've screwed this thing up. Um, so a couple months or a couple years ago, God said, I can't have any more games on my cell phone. And every time he does, he gives me a lot of conviction about it because I waste a lot of time on there and I'm a dork. And so... Surprise, surprise, surprise. Um, so I was looking, I was like, ah, I can get around this one. I can download Christian games, and then it'll be great. I'll get to learn scripture, and I can play a game for hours rotting my brain out. It's, it's perfect. So you type in Christian underneath an app store, and the first three things that come up is Christian dating. I'm like, well, that's not going to work. I'm like, all right, uh, let's go underneath that. Well, I already have the Bible app, a U version, and that's pretty impressive. So I don't need an, a fourth Bible app. All right, go down a little more. Uh, more Christian dating site, huh? Like, but that's the whole thing is like, like we are yearning to be with others. We are desiring for intimacy. We want to be known. We want to be seen. We want to be loved. But we're missing the aspect on how that happens. We're missing the motor that drives the car. And that's where I would say, not only is it not a triangle, but we're not even in the right shape yet. So this picture, it's, what we do is we want the triangle because we want it nice and simple, but it's a curved feature. And I'm sure our high school algebra people can tell us, oh, it's a sine wave with a, the cosine of the tangent and the thingamabobber. And if I only remembered Pythagorean theorem, I, sh- I should have studied it more. But not only is, but the problem is, is the triangle drives us to togetherness, but we're yearning for closeness. As we come together for the sake of the gospel, it drives us to closeness. We're around other people. If we're pursuing God, he has a mission for us that's too big for each of us, so we need closeness. But really what we're desiring in our approach is intimacy, We're desiring intimacy with others. We're desiring intimacy with God. And intimacy is, it's beyond beyond closeness. Intimacy, make sure I get this right so I don't um, screw this up too much. Intimacy is, is holding the hair back of your best friend while they're puking their brains out in the toilet. Intimacy is, is, going with your friend or spouse wig shopping after chemo treatments. Intimacy is having to change the bedpan of an elderly friend because you're there for them and they, they're in need of somebody to be there. Intimacy is this idea that it doesn't matter what you've done, I still love you. I'm still here for you. It doesn't matter what you do, I'm not going to forsake you. Intimacy is what we're yearning for. We want somebody in our life to say, if I screw up, will you still be here? Half the songs on the radio are the idea that, will somebody love me even though I'm broken? Will somebody be with me even though I'm lonely? Intimacy is this idea that no matter what happens, I'm not going to be abandoned. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he lost his intimacy with God as he was handed the sins of all mankind. And he asked God, God, why have you forsaken me? Because the intimacy was ripped apart for the first time. That's why he was bleeding from his pores and his skin when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, when, when he was given the choice to be the Savior of all mankind. He said, God, is there any other way than to have the intimacy torn from his Father in heaven? Is there any other way than to lose the closeness he had with his Abba Father? Can't we just make a flash of light 
and make it good for everyone. And I don't have to lose my intimacy with you. And basically, God said somebody has to pay the price of sin for mankind because he loves you. He loves sitting the, the person sitting next to you. He loves the person that's watching online. He loves us so much that somebody had to pay the price of our sin. And through Jesus hanging on the cross and having the intimacy ripped from his soul and his heart and his very being, that's why he asked, God, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was never the idea that, that God had abandoned him, but when it comes down to it, when it comes down to us, isn't that what we ask Jesus when times are hard? Um, hopefully, yes, perfect. Genesis 3.8 picks up with Adam and Eve, and it says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. This is after they ate the fruit. This is immediately after. They ate the sin. They turned their backs on God, said, I'm going to do this despite what God said not to do. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was waiting in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. They hid from him, the garden. Keep that, just target that out here. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Now, God knows where they are. He was asking them, where are you? Because he's letting them know that they're hiding from him. God knows what happened then to the ends of the time. And so when we, we shouldn't be surprised when God's asking, where are you? We should be heartbroken. We should be heartbroken that we, he's asking that of us. Where are you, Sam? Where are you, Stacy? Where are you? Because God is desiring a relation with us that's intimate, that's, that's founded on this idea that no matter what we do, God will still be there. But, but what about all the hard things? God is there with the hard things. If anything, we can see God more in our suffering and our struggles than we can in our blessings and our abundance. We can see God move mountains when we're trapped and when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. We can see God do miracles when he gives us a day when we thought our life was going to end. We can see God restore marriages when we were ready to fill out the divorce forms and, cash, and, and just wipe our hands clean of it. We can see God do the impossible but too often, we're still stuck at this question, where are we? Where am I? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. Can you have intimacy and still be afraid? I don't think so. Because I was naked, so I hid. I was ashamed of who I am. I carry the feelings and the emotions and the pain and the hurt and the regret and the abandonment and the lostness. And I hid them because I didn't want somebody to see me. I didn't want somebody to see my brokenness and my ugliness. I didn't want them to see the scars. I didn't want them to see the regrets and the mistakes that I made. I put on a mask so that they couldn't see my soul anymore. I avoided going out with people because I didn't want them to hurt me anymore. I turned away from friendships because I was tired of losing loved ones. I no longer risked love because it hurt too much if it didn't work out. I lost my intimacy to stand before God, to be loved by God, and so I ran and hid in the trees, in the brush, where you couldn't see me, where you couldn't find me. Verse 11, he says, God says, who told you that you were lost and broken and unimportant and unlovable? Who told you that you were ugly? Who told you that you were a mistake? Who told you that your life didn't matter? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Have you believed the lie the devil tempted you with? Have you pulled away from our relationship of intimacy and love? All throughout Scripture, as you read through it, you see each book of the Bible as God's relationship with mankind. You see his intimacy pulled out, stretched, elaborated on, building, growing. You see God's divine, just unbelievable, unhuman comprehensible love for us. Psalms 139, 
oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. This was, we shared this a couple weeks ago, if it sounds familiar. You have searched me and known me, just as he did Adam and Eve. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar, even when we hide behind the tree. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. Jeremiah 12, 3 says, But you, O oh Lord, know me. You see me and you test my heart towards you. Just as he did Adam and Eve in the garden. It says, where are you? He knew where they are. But do they know where they are? Do we know where we're at in relation to God? Do we know our re how our intimacy goes? Do we have the strength through God to do what he's calling us to do? The whole reason the Holy Spirit came into our lives is so that we can do the impossible. And now this isn't just speaking in tongues or healing the dead, but this is going out and overcoming our fears, overcoming our brokenness, overcoming our unfaithfulness, and ultimately overcoming the sin that has enslaved our lives that keeps us from being the people that Jesus has called us to be. It goes back to the question, where are you? I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. Uh, John 10, 4.15 Sorry, guys. Uh, I am the good shepherd. This is Jesus talking on behalf of God. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, Paul writes this to the church of Las Vegas, basically, the church of Corinth. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. What a profound statement if you love god you who were born an enemy of god who were born at war with god who were born hiding in the wilderness saying god i want no part of you and for god to say come into your life and show that he is love that he is beauty that he is peace that he is intimacy if anyone loves God, he is known by God because we can't even fathom what love is apart from God's love for us. Why would any of us love a God that we cannot see until God gives us sight to see him? Why would any of us want to, to read a book without being able to know the author, the author of a book that's written for us by a God who speaks through it? We look, at these, we look at these scriptures and we see that God knows us deeply, but our human comprehension, our understanding, our, our experiences, our relationships tell us a different story. God couldn't possibly know us intimately because if he did, he would never love me. God wouldn't possibly send his son for me, a worthless nobody, a slave, a person who has nothing to offer him. My best thing to offer him is what? At least the drummer boy on Christmas could play him a song. John's got at least a song he could play him. I don't even have that. I, what do I have the, to offer the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the one who created everything that is anything and anything that is everything? What could I give him? Why would he want to know me out of six billion people? Why would his son, why would he give his son for me? We look at the world, we look at the temptations, we look at the pain and the suffering and the struggles in this life. And the devil lies to us and says, God doesn't love you. God doesn't want to know you. His scripture, his love story to us tells a different story. It tells him that he deeply knows us. It tells him that he knows every hair in our bodies, even the ones we don't want there. And he even knew the hairs that aren't there anymore. He knows everything about us, and he still says, I love you. How many of us could, could love our family, love our spouses, love ourselves in such a way? And yet, God stepped through time and space to walk with us and talk with us and be with us. And when he went, and when Jesus went back to heaven, it was only so that he could send the Holy Spirit to dwell in every one of us. Because Jesus was one man, and the Holy Spirit is an entire kingdom of people 
that come to glorify God, not just Sunday mornings, but all week long when we play with the children and we teach our, our classes and when we're serving people that come for needs, it's, it's, we're doing it not because we want to feel good and pat ourselves on the back. If it's not one, it's a thousand. If it's not locally, it's nationally. It's around the world. We can't possibly meet all the needs. There's no point in trying. There's, we, don't, we don't have the abilities. There's, no, there's not enough resources. But for that one, for that one person, it was enough. And we may not be able to change the whole world, but we can change the world for that one. And it starts with faithfulness. And faithfulness starts with trusting God. And trusting God starts with going before God, saying, I don't want to hide in the bushes anymore. I don't want to hide in the garden anymore. Some of us, we, we went to church and we, we said this prayer and we got baptized and we went through all the steps. We went through classes and we did all these different things. But at the end of the day, when it's just us and we look in the mirror, we can hear God's echo of his voice asking, where are you, my son, my daughter? Why have you not stopped and just sat down with me today? Why have you not just spent time in my word, spending time with me? And we go, God, I just, I got too much to do. God, I got too many trees to hide behind. God, if you knew the struggles I was dealing with, you wouldn't ask such hard things of me. And he does because he loves us. Because when we step out of the garden, when we step into the light, when we step and say, God, I'm tired of hiding. I'm tired of putting on the mask every day for the people around me. I'm tired of to running the race that never ends. God, I'm just tired. That's why, that's why the Ten Commandments, he gave us a day to rest. A physical, tangible day that says, I know things are tough. I know things are hard. Follow my example. You think God needed the rest? He, he blinked the world into existence. He breathed it into light, life. He didn't need the rest, but because he loved us, he set the example for us to trust him enough that the world will continue going if we stop and breathe for a minute. What does that look like to say, okay, God, I love you so much. I'm going to trust that this this giant stack of plates with all the stuff I have stacked on, it's not going to go crashing on the ground. I'm going to give you two minutes today. I'm going to give you two minutes, God. It's going to be two minutes more than yesterday. And I don't know what's going to happen when I ha those two minutes happen, but we're going to try it out. And then two minutes happen, and God does miracles. God is still doing miracles 2,000 years after the apostles walked this earth. Anybody that said otherwise is either a fool or unfaithful. God does miracles. He's doing miracles all the time. And he's doing miracles when we step out into the sea. He's doing miracles when we step out into the faithfulness. We're doing miracles when he's stepping out into surrender, into trust. It's the faithfulness and the trust that God counts us as good. It's not a magic prayer that we say when we were 2, 6, 18, 43, those are good, tangible points to help us in our walk, but it's our faithfulness day in and day out, the perseverance, the, the believing that God is with us, and the pausing to feel God in us. So this week, I would challenge you with three things as we get ready to close for today. I would challenge you with these three challenges this week. Pray ugly prayers. Well, what are you talking about? I mean, I, I look in the mirror, and every prayer is pretty... Ugh. But pray ugly prayers. This idea that we can't be angry at God, that we can't yell, kick, and scream at God, it's not biblical. Job was covered in lesions, agonizing, lost his children, lost his job, lost his business, lost his... The only thing he didn't lose is the wife that said, just go and die, and the best friends that said, oh, it's your fault. He cries out to God saying, God, what is going on? I can't take it anymore. He doesn't say God's not there. He doesn't say God's unfaithful, but it's an ugly prayer. 
when the women went up to Jesus after, after Lazarus died, do you think they high-fived him and said, hey, got some interesting news for you? You know that, that friend of yours, the one that we had dinner with and spent all that time with and the intimate late-night conversations and you said you'd be there for? Uh, he's dead. No. They came and they sobbed and they were weeping and they were brokenhearted. They weren't wearing a mask that said, get all your stuff figured out, then come to Jesus. Take your baggage, take your suitcases, take your backpacks, take it all to Jesus and lay him at the cross. Say, God, this stuff is ugly. I'm tired of dealing with it. I don't know what to do with it. My kid doesn't come to church. My parents dying. My friend's an alcoholic. The world's falling apart. It's all yours. <laughs> Ugly prayers. Pray ugly prayers. Second one is to pray to make friends that you trust. Lots of us have friends. I got 500 friends on Facebook. I'm so popular. Do you trust any of them? Do you know when their birthdays are without the reminders? Do you talk to them on a weekly basis? Do you know what they're struggling with? Could you name three things that happened in the last year that they needed you for, that they relied on you for, and they talked to you? Pray to make friends that you trust. Social media, smartphones, they've, they've ripped us apart where, oh, I'll just have a quick conversation. We'll call that friendship. That's called an acquaintance. It's called a coworker. Friends trust one another. They share one another. They lean on one another. And out of that comes intimacy. And that's the third part, is talk about your emotions. Prideful, self-righteous, arrogant, conceited, sinner. If you're not talking about your emotions, if you're not talking about the things that you're struggling with, go through the list. Why am I prideful? Why am I so arrogant? Why am I so self-righteous? Why am I above Jesus? Find somebody to talk about your emotions with. Anybody. And as a kid, it's hard to talk to your parents about emotions. As a parent, it's hard to talk to anybody about your emotions. As an adult, it's hard to even know what your emotions are. That's why we're all so messed up. That's why you can't find counselor available. Every single one's booked out for years. Spending a year tied up at home, having our society ripped apart, and a crisis starting every three days. We have emotions. God gives us good emotions to deal with. But we need to process that. We need to work through that. We need to, to do what the gospel calls us to do. Out of that comes intimacy. Out of knowing that I can talk to somebody about my pain and my hurt and my struggles. Knowing that when I came to Jesus, I surrendered my mind. I surrendered my heart. And I surrendered my soul. I'm not going to carry the baggage around my whole life. I'm going to release it. The devil has no hold when my emotions don't control me. The devil has no hold when I have a group of friends praying for me. The devil has no hold when I'm willing to come out of the, we the woods and stand before Jesus. These might sound like easy challenges, but I guarantee you these will change your life and bring you closer to Jesus than most books outside of the Bible ever will. There's some really great books. We actually got a copy of The Radical by David Platt. I challenge anybody to read that one without getting mad. Um, sorry, side tangent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word provokes us to transformation, that your scripture, that your relationship calls upon us to do what we ourselves couldn't do. Lord, we thank you that you don't command us to change but that you call us to, for the opportunity to be more like your son, to be more like your daughter. Lord, we thank you that you are loving, that you are the definition of love, and that no matter how society perverts it, changes it, lies about it, and manipulates it, we can always come out of the woods and see you, and you're always there for us. You're there for us in our darkest day, and you're there for us in our best day. You're there for us when we don't know what to say, and you're there for us when we don't know what to do. Lord, we thank you that your love is unconditional. We can't earn it. We can't lose it. 
All we can do is trust in it. Lord, show yourself this week as we step out in faithfulness and boldness to do what maybe we've never done. Amen. All right, friends, please stand and let's show a little joy in the house of the Lord. And Rick, this was one of your requests, so I better hear you singing up here. <laughs> We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way Cause he hung upon that cross Then he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet Oh, we shout out your praise There's joy in the house of the Lord our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise Cause we were the beggars Now we're royalty We were the prisoners Now we're running free We are forgiven, accepted Redeemed by His grace Let the house of the Lord sing praise There's joy in the house of the Lord there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. All right, guys. Go out and uh, God bless. Have a great week.